Welcome to the Human Performance Outliers podcast with your hosts, Dr. Sean Baker and Zach Bitter. At Human Performance Outliers podcast, we dive into a wide range of topics revolving around health, nutrition, and physical fitness. If you enjoy the show and wish to support us, please visit patreon.com forward slash HPO podcast. If you do not use Patreon but still wish to support us, please also consider checking out our PayPal page at paypal.me forward slash HPO pod. The link to both of those can also be found in the show notes. Finally, please consider subscribing to us on your favorite podcast listening platform. Now, on to the next topic. Podcast. So, how much time do you have? No, just, just, uh... I'm, I'm free. I cleared out my... Gotcha. Okay, so we, we yeah, typically my go daughter's, on, you know, My daughter's going to keep an eye on the, the wacky bull terrier so that she doesn't interrupt us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've got, a, I've got one dog in a room with me, yeah. and I think if he hears a squirrel outside or something like that, he may. Dogs make an appearance on the show from time to time. And sometimes they do. Yeah, I, just a, a couple of times ago, your dog showed up, as I recall. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they do. Yeah, once in a yeah my, my poor dogs, they because uh, if I leave them outside, then they bark at the, at the squirrels and whatever. And if I bring them in, sometimes they start walking around. I've got wood floors in the room I'm at, so I hear the tick-tick-tick exactly. of the dogs. Yeah, exactly. I Mine pet them or something like that or hold them in my lap yeah. so they calm down. And Mine, anyway, I saw that uh, Dr. Dr. Garth Davis put his dog on a vegan diet here and just announced that. I'm very sad for the poor doggy. Oof. <laughs> but they, I mean, it's, it's, it's bad enough when lay people do this. We don't yeah. have an understanding of anatomy or physiology or but when when people who actually have some kind type of science background do that it's it's really it is a little it is a little sad I mean, for dogs. hard for yeah. me to understand it's i consider it animal abuse but well i mean you think if, if, if the whole vegan ethos is about allowing animals emancipation and freedom to do what they choose you know and live the life they would naturally pursue you know so on and so forth there's no way in hell a dog would choose and eating rice and corn isn't it <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I feel sorry for, sure. for a small kid or animal that's raised in that guy's house, man. He's going to go after him. But anyway, let's get on to this stuff. So, Don, um, for people that don't know who you are, and, and you know, because your 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 name on Twitter is definitely suspicious for being a fake name. When I saw Jane Doe, I'm like, that's probably mm, not a real name. You think? <laughs> it's it's but, a little bit of an inside joke because I'm an emergency doctor and we have a lot yeah, of Jane. Sure. Yeah, 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 sure. Jane, Joe, John Doe coming in. But yeah, tell us a little quick about your background and then we'll get into your story. And just as a preview, you guys that see behind me, I'm, I'm always topical on my background themes, even though I'm pixelated today. Yes. So anyway, so anyway, Don, give us a little brief history, a little bit of background on you, and then we can start getting into some of this fascinating well, um, stuff. I am 58 years old. Uh, I am an emergency physician by training. I was educated in the United States. I've lived in Denmark for the last 10 years. I have a Danish husband, two American Danish kids. They were born in America, but we moved here when they were little. Um, I have something called Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, as you mentioned. Uh, there are many types of EDS. Uh, uh, they're connective tissue disorder. The type I have is called hypermobile type. It's one of the more common types of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. So it's uh, characterized, as you mentioned, as we mentioned earlier, by joint hypermobility. The thumb sign is one of them. Um, people may also have a lot of joint subluxations, partial dislocations, or full dislocations. Um, they, um, other things can go along with it, like, you know, skin, hyperextensible skin, um, uh, atrophic scarring. Uh, for people with EDS, uh, hypermobile EDS, it might be common to have something like mitral valve prolapse, which I developed in my early 30s. Um, along with it goes a lot of chronic pain, and the pain tends to get worse as you get older. The other thing that happens is that we often develop osteoarthritis early due to the mobility and the micro um, friction that goes on in the joints constantly. So people with EDS often have joints that um, feel like they're 80 when they're 30. Uh, fatigue is very common because we use our muscles to stabilize ourselves, which is why, um, in my, from my perspective, having strong muscles is crucial to surviving Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome well. Um, and, but that can be difficult when you live in a lot of pain. 
So um, associated with EDS also I have something called POTS, posterior orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. That's um, a lot of people with EDS have that. And I've also had some autoimmune problems which aren't related, I think, <laughs> to EDS as far as we know. Don, yeah, I mean, you know, as an orthopedic guy, I mean, I would run into obviously the the sort of the joint subluxation, dislocation issues, and it's kind of sad because there's not much you can do. I mean, other than like you get to where you like maybe fusing joints potentially, but you know, the normal procedures we would use, you know, stability procedures using tissue just fail because the tissue itself is 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 not going to maintain, and so you're kind of stuck with it. It's very sad, and I would see kids who come into my clinic that, I mean, their, their shoulder is dislocated hundreds of times, their ankle would dislocate right. you know, a couple of times a week. It was just, it was just normal thing. You'd walk, you know, it'd be walking down the, down the street and, you know, their joint, their, their joint dislocates. And, and it's, right. I it's, saw, it's, you know, that as a younger people, but I mean, it's very important to realize that this is progressively gets worse and you end up with, you know, significant exactly. joint destruction. So, um, and, and there's some cardiac, you know, you talked about mitral valve and I know that you have an increased, tendency towards aneurysmal type things and you know that, that's more for the vascular types for and, the vascular types yeah right yeah so, so there are a lot of types um the vascular type of eds is different and they have more they're the people that keep emergency doctors and trauma do and vascular surgeons up at night because we worry about them rupturing their aorta we have a young person coming in with an aortic rupture or other aneurysmal ruptures um, carotid artery uh, dissections. They're, they're the, your young patient without, um, without uh, vas otherwise known vascular disease. Those are the people that really, and they, they often die young and it's a, a very devastating illness. But it is different from hypermobile. And, and, and as, as this discussion continues and we get into this, the most fascinating part of this, and like I said, I've seen, you know, since I've been doing this carnivore stuff, some really interesting things, but this is a genetic disease. This is not yes. something that is caused by some environmental, this is no. a solid genetic disease. Right. I find fascinating the fact that, you know, we'll, we'll get you into the story. Autosome dominant, yeah. Right, so this is clearly a genetic disease. You clearly have it, and it's not something you've, made up or mm -hmm. pretending or anything. I have it, my siblings have it, and by description, probably our mother was the source of it. She was Gumby. You know, when I was a child, my nickname was Gumby Girl, as, as are a lot of people with EDS, uh, with hypermobile or hypermobility syndrome. Um, you know, I can put both of my legs behind my head and, you know, do all those fun party tricks, you know, like spontaneously dislocating your joints to freak your friends out that now I teach my children not to. Both of my children both have the other the syndrome as well. Fascinating. You know, um, so, you know, it's kind of interesting. I, you know, I, I ran into you through most social media, through Twitter. I saw you were, you know, in, you know, kind of into that. And I think you, I don't know if you, yeah. how did you start? So now let me, I'll just fast forward a little bit. I know you're on a carnivorous diet right now yes. and it is significantly helpful with the situation, but tell me about, your sort of descent into madness, as I call it, as you, you know, you go from the orthodoxy where it's eat all, eat a bunch of plants to all of a sudden now we're just exactly. eating meat. And, and so as a physician, I mean, obviously you had- How did I go to the dark side? <laughs> right, or the dark side or, or the light side, depending on what team you're light on. Light side, exactly. Yeah, so, and you know, it's kind of interesting. So let, let's just talk about your sort of, what made you decide to go on a meat-based diet? How's it been? And talk about, you know, as a physician, you know, what kind yeah. of hurdles you have to overcome? Because I mean, you know, it's it's one thing for some guy on Instagram to say, I'm going to eat meat and stuff like that. But right. it's another thing for a physician that, you know, has had it beat into them their whole life. This is the way we should do it. So anyway, I want to hear right. your story about that. Well, I will, I will back up and say that I started questioning the dogma of nutrition when I was in medical school. Um, I... I probably ate like everybody else did at that point. Um, and in about second year medical school, I started looking around and noticing that we all looked like hell. You know, like we came in looking fine and fresh and after two years of medical school, we were all getting sort of fat and, and beaten down and tired and looked pretty bad. And I decided I needed to do something about it. And the first person that I ever read anything that questioned the whole idea about high carbohydrate, low fat diets was a guy named Barry Sears. He wrote a book called The Zone. And even though his 
ratios were still way off in terms of how much carbohydrate you needed or if you needed it at all. He was the first person sort of planted the idea that, hey, you know, sugar is a problem and wheat and grains are a problem. You know, I think he didn't do so much grains, but wheat. And so I started questioning it then. And during that time, I started watching how we were educating diabetics and the things we were telling them to eat. To eat. And logically, it just didn't make sense to me. It didn't make sense to pour more gasoline on the fire of diabetes with carbohydrates. So that was there. But, you know, you sort of go on and you're in med school and residency and you know how it is. You eat what you can eat, you know, and somebody hands you a bagel and that's great because that might be the last thing you eat for the, for the next day because you're, you know, running or in the OR or whatever. The residency I did, we were heavily surgical residency, so I spent a lot of my life in the OR like you did. And um, so um, then along the way, I started really questioning this, this whole, you know, I, 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 had, I knew that sugar was a problem. I pretty much eliminated wheat. But um, I, I still was having trouble. I was still sick. I still was, uh, you know, my, I started to develop autoimmune problems. I have a, a whole, I developed Hashimoto's thyroiditis. And then I started developing something that every time it flared up, every rheumatologist said, it looks like you have lupus. It looks and acts like lupus. And then it, the tests would be negative, which is actually pretty common for a lot of women. Um, and so I then went on a paleo diet and that I got interested in sort of ancest ancestral nutrition and eating the way we evolved. And that was sort of the first real solid step that I made on this. But I was still eating a lot of plants, not realizing that plants were a problem for me. I had no idea. I, like everyone else, thought that eating lots of vegetables and fruits and things. So I was eating lean meat and didn't know that was really part of the problem and lots of plants, but I didn't eat, you know, grains and refined sugars or, or I would go back and forth because I found that some carbohydrates would lead me to more carbohydrates, <laughs> which can be a, a problem. And then um, I really was getting very sick. I mean, recently, uh, last year, I was waking up with, you know, bilateral shoulder dislocations, my hips subluxed, my ankle dislocated, uh, a roller coaster ride of autoimmune problems, my thyroid illness difficult to control. I was on very, very high levels of thyroid meds, including T, um, uh, T3 and T4, and barely subnormal you know, labs. And my husband stumbled across that Business Insider article with Michaela Peterson and her death. Um, it's, I think that the title was Academics All Meat Diet Ruffles Feathers and had sort of a funny name. And I read it and a bell went off in my head. And I went, huh, this is interesting. Part of me said, this is insane. You know, like how crazy to, you know, who, who, who eats only meat? I thought that was insane, but I was really desperate. I, I was sick all the time. I, I, I hurt all the time. Pain was a 24 seven experience for me. And I just said, why not? What is 30 days gonna hurt? I'll either get scurvy and that would be sort of interesting or <laughs> <laughs> because I've never seen scurvy clinically. So, um, or, or else it wouldn't matter and I would, you know, Ditch it. And after 30 days, I was already starting to feel a little bit better. And I thought, well, why not go 60 days? You know, let's see what happens. By 60 days, I was starting to feel better. The pain was starting to level off enough that I was able to get back to the gym. I've always worked out, but in the last few years, I wasn't able to because my pain control wasn't good enough to let me work out. It, it was just too difficult. And I was able to get back in the gym, which is my favorite place to be. And um, for me, with, with joint hypermobility, I rely on my muscles to stabilize my joints. But, um, so I just hung in there and I knew, I could tell by then, this is right for me. This feels good. And luckily, you were the second person that I sort of stumbled on in that journey. You know, I went from reading that first article and then... I happened to stumble on you and started following you and reading about you. And so I kind of right away just went to mostly meat and water. I didn't do any in-between 
you know, or transition. I never even heard of the keto diet until I did the carnivore diet. Like I've never heard of it. <laughs> Maybe it's being in Denmark and it's not so, so popular and trendy here, but I just, you know, I, I knew right away that, that it's, it was sort of an all or nothing thing for me. And I've now started to figure out that it's more than just the carbohydrates. I've always done better on lower amounts of carbohydrates, but there's something else going on. And I think it's probably some of the things that are in plants that have been probably contributing to my overall levels of inflammation in my joints possibly. But now I, so where am I today? So it's been almost 11 months. I have not had a full joint dislocation since I started. Said, well, within, you know, it took about a month for that to settle down, you know, month-ish, six weeks, something like that. I, I have some minor subluxations in joints that are sort of chronically unstable, but nothing terrible. I only had, I've only had one serious subluxate, subluxation and managed to sublux my clavicle doing push-ups. <laughs> had to yank my own clavicle back into place. Um, I haven't had a flare-up with my autoimmune symptoms since I started the carnivore diet. And up until now, for the last decade, it's been a roller coaster of constantly being sick. My pain levels have gradually decreased to, I'm now, I would say, about 5% of what I used to. I take no pain medicine now, none. Other, once in a while, I use CBD oil if something is really bothering me. I take not even acetaminophen, no ibuprofen. And I used to sometimes have to take stronger medications for serious injuries, nothing. That's unheard of for a 58 year old Ehlers Danlos patient. Yeah, I'm so. gonna say that's, I mean, that's truly you know, fascinating. And I, I think, I mean, cause you said you've had zero full dislocations, a couple minor subluxations in, in the last 11 months outside of the first month. Mm -hmm. How would that contrast to the frequency of what you were seeing for the previous years? I mean, how often would you have dislocations? How often would you see subluxations? Every day, many times a day. So I would wake up in the morning with both shoulders fully dislocated. And I would do this little routine to sort of wiggle my shoulder and get one in so then I could yank the other one back in. My right hip would be sublux, so I would have to kind of rotate my hip until I could get it back into place. And my an right ankle would be kind of rotated completely off laterally. Um, and um, I, that was my morning. And morning for me, opening my eyes was hitting a wall of pain with one to four joints maybe dislocated. And then that would repeat through the day. Sometimes I would have falls because when your joints give out, you just lose. I mean, people with the hypermobile EDS falling isn't that unusual. Their case. I mean, I mean, <laughs> sorry, dog is talking. So that is truly. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I got a couple of questions. I think. Um, first of all, I think it's. Max, you know. Incredibly interesting, just the level of discomfort that you normalize when you're in a situation like that. I, I had a yes. friend once who had an injury from football that his, his shoulder would dislocate every once in a while. And it was like maybe a couple times every other month or so. And when it would pop out on him, though, it was like you could just see like the pain and the discomfort. And then like he kind of work it back in and he kind of learned how to do that. And imagining that happening on a daily basis or just knowing when you wake up in the morning, having that there, I think most people are going to have a hard time really understanding what type of a kind of lifestyle hurdle that actually is. Um, or if nothing else, feel very fortunate that their joints stay in place. Um, the, the, the question that, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the question I kind of have with it, and I asked uh, Dr. Ann Childress this as well, because she kind of had a similar thing. And, and you mentioned that, uh, you strengthening your muscles is, is, is ideal in that situation because those are going to help kind of stabilize the area. And the question I asked her is like, how do you even put together a, a resistance training routine that you can trust? Because my first thought is if I went into the weight room with that condition, I'd be terrified to bear any weight that like my ankle was going to dislocate or shoulders can dislocate while I'm holding weight above my head or, you know, even carrying anything. Is there mm -hmm. a 
the specific routine you follow or how do you kind of navigate the strength routine stuff? Well, I mean, I have the advantage that I've lifted weights often on my whole life. So I'm very comfortable in the gym and I know how to lift correctly. For someone who did, is new to the strength training, I would not recommend that they just jump in <clears throat> without um, talking, preferably talking to someone who knows a little bit about maybe a physical therapist who knows about um, joint hypermobility. Um, I wouldn't expect a trainer to know, but there might be someone out there, but certainly not to, because you can get hurt. I mean, they're, they're, there's a good chance they'll get hurt. But um, for me, one thing I do is I wrap joints that are unstable. Any joints that I know are like, I always have wrapped my knees anyway, but I once had a full posterior knee dislocation and Dr. Baker will know how catastrophic that can be. And it almost never happens outside of blunt force trauma. But in my case, it happened helping me, helping my daughter put her jeans on when she was little, <laughs> stepping backwards and my tibia came out the back of me. Um, and so I have a very unstable right knee. I wrap my knees, but, and, um, I, and I wear joint supports on anything that might be unstable. And then the other thing is that I am super focused when I work out. I'm never distracted. I'm always completely paying attention to what's going on with my body. I live slowly, I live carefully. And I do push weights pretty hard because I love to lift heavy weights. But there are some things I back off on. Like I, I love to squat, but um, although my legs are certainly strong enough to squat a lot heavier than I do, my spine can't take that axial loading. So I back off on the weight. I still do it, but I go up to the point where I feel that it's too much for me. And then a lot of it is just absolutely paying attention to my body. If, if something hurts, I back off. I know there are certain things I have a hard time doing. Um, even though my shoulders, I can do this now. I, I didn't used to be able to lift my arms above my head. Brushing my hair was becoming a problem. Just reaching for something, my whole shoulder would flop out, and now I can, you know, lift my arms and it's no problem. I have full range of motion, more than full range of motion actually. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> but, um, you know, I, one motion I have trouble with is military press, you know, and I just don't do it. Things that feel like they're going to hurt me, I just don't do it. I find other ways to train that muscle that isn't going to injure me. That's interesting. I, it, I just think it's always a kind of a, a cool exploration of like what people are doing when the the norm or the, the the typical pro protocol isn't necessarily uh approachable for them and you know i i think a i think a lot of times people when they're thinking of joints and they're thinking of tendons and they're thinking of muscles they're thinking them as as separate from one another or different focus points yeah. when in reality a lot of that stuff is going to be tied together and and i've certainly had nowhere near the uphill battle that you've had with that sort of thing but i do remember you know i do a lot of long distance running and historically yeah. i've always had weaker ankles or weaker lower leg muscles like especially when i was in college mm -hmm. i had a, quite a bit of like tendonitis type stuff in my achilles and lower leg type issues mm -hmm. flare up and when i went out of college i started addressing that stuff with you know, strength things for lower legs, wearing kind of natural running shoes and stuff to really let those yeah. muscles in that area. And then the tendons and ligaments as well really get strong and work through their full range of motion in order to strengthen those and turn that from a weakness to a strength. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it takes a lot of time, but you can certainly do it. And I think you're probably an example of, of that yeah. in, in a much grander scheme of things or more holistic with your entire body, essentially. Yeah, it, it, it's... Just Don, I just want to interject something here because I just think, you know, I mean, what you said is just so incredible to me that you can go from, you know, constant daily waking up with three or four joints dislocated to nothing. And, and I mean, I'm just trying to figure, I'm trying to figure out what is the mechanism going on beyond and behind all this. And, I know. and, you know, we're both kind of baffled, I think sounds like, but I'm just wondering, do you, do you attribute that solely to the fact that you're, not as inflamed and you're able to lift weights more or do you think it's beyond that because that's, that's i think it's multifactorial um okay. i do think it is as you said um also i lost about 30 plus pounds and i'm not somebody who's tended to gain a lot of weight in life but you know getting older and when you stop moving for any reason 
you're going to gain weight. And when you're in constant pain and dislocating joints or living on crutches a lot of the time, you've seen when I posted my, my hated crutches that are now gathering dust in my closet. And they used to be nearby all the time because I never knew when I was going to need them. And now they're somewhere in the back of my closet. Um, <clears throat> when you go, you know, when you spend your life like that, you do gain weight. And the, the What's important to know is 30 pounds, I know I've seen people lose 100 pounds and 200 pounds and lots of weight on carnivore diet. I could never have handled that. Uh, people with joint hypermobility, 30 pounds may as well be 100 pounds. It throws us so far off balance and we are so unable to sort of manage our joints that a little bit of weight is really devastating for us. So losing that weight helped a lot. Um, Strengthening the muscles so I can stabilize my joints helps a lot. Um, but there is something else going on that I do not understand. That um, because the pain levels just, the way that they decreased, it felt, you know, is it lower overall body inflammation from whether it's carbohydrates or, you know, lectins or who knows in, in, in plant foods? Um, but the stability, and also, I have so much more range. Of, like my, I had so much arthritis in my lower back and in my hands and certain joints. And very arthritic joints are now moving. I can do a full back bend again. And my lower back just wasn't moving like that anymore because I had so much arthritis in my back. So there's clearly something going on, some, some tissue remodeling or something that's going on that I really admit to not understanding that this is why I keep saying we need research, you know, because the, there is more than just the overall, you know, the lack of carbohydrates and, you know, there, there's something going on that I think that we will discover someday that I'm grateful for it, I'd love to have it, but I sure would like to understand it. Yeah, I'm and, just wondering because you, you demonstrated, you know, the, the, the tissue hyperelasticity has that changed a little bit? Can you, are you less elastic? Are you, I mean, because I'm just wondering if there's actually some level of tissue change that's going on, you know, at, at that level. I mean, we had Dr. Paul Mason on yesterday and we kind of talked a little bit about you know, okay. something going on with mixed metalloproteinases. Uh, and, 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 you know, we may be seeing problems with secondary to non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and it resolves in that sense to, to improve that. But that, again, it's all pretty speculative at this point, but are you seeing, other than the, the inflammation, the lack of subluxations, are you, are you noticing any change in the hyperelasticity that you're seeing? I, you know, that I haven't noticed and my skin feels the same. I mean, uh, but what I, what I have noticed is like my neck changed. You know, and I don't know if that, you know, like as I was getting older, I was starting to get, you know, I never had a very fatty neck, but um, after I lost some weight, I kind of hated the way my neck looked for a while because it looked a little weird. And then it's like it completely changed and I lost all that weird extra tissue and it's all kind of tightened up and I'm finding the same thing happening elsewhere in my body that my skin is just firming up. I'm, I don't know that I'm any less, you know, um, my skin, you know, is still stretchy, but it's not, um, it doesn't feel quite as fragile. Like one thing that I've noticed, um, one thing that happens with people with EDS is we bruise a lot. We look, you know, we look like somebody's been beating us up pretty often because there is some vascular fragility unlike the large vessel fragility there's small vascular fragility even in people with hypermobile or in people with classical EDS also and so we bruise a lot it takes a long time to heal things you know uh, I, I've dehissed every single wound I've ever had every surgical wound every you know lack that I've had sewn up this comes out um, and I'm healing better and I'm not covered in bruises all the time and I wasn't anemic before. The bruising isn't due to, it's not that kind of thing. Um, I've always had a really high crit and, you know, hemoglobin, and it, that's never been a problem for me. It, but it seems to be there's less tissue fragility. At least that's my observation. Yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, that really is truly fascinating to me. Let me ask you, because you said you have several family members, you know, children, uh, relatives, mm -hmm. I think sisters and stuff like that. Have you sort of talked to them about changing their diet? And if so, have they made any changes and noticed any difference? Um, I, I t my daughter 
uh, who is 17, went on the carnivore diet a few months ago. She too was uh, kind of more paleo than not, but she's also a teenager, you know, and they vacillate between eating boatloads of junk food and, you know, um, and, you know, te teenagers here in Denmark, they're pretty different than American teenagers. They, they drink heavily. <laughs> not, not that my daughter does, but it's really common to go out and party and have beers. It's not considered a big deal here. But she just eliminated all of that along and with going on a carnivore diet. And she feels great. You know, I think I was kind of mentioning this the other day. Um, what I've noticed is her skin is absolutely clear. Um, she just lost all the teenage skin. She feels better. She has a lot more energy. She too is in the gym, lifting weights, working out. She looks amazing. She's absolutely ripped um, because she's, she's got the youth on her side. So she's, <laughs> her body is like instantly responding. She says her subjective experience is that she feels calmer and more focused. She just got her grades back for the year and absolutely knocked it out of the park on all of her on all of her grades um, and I just noticed that she's just a lot more focused you know she does she doesn't have that sort of teenage emotional liability that goes on nearly as much and um, she's incredibly excited about the carnival diet she happens to go to a, a gymnasium which is the name of high schools in Denmark she happens to go to a high school where they have a vegan um, cafeteria <laughs> So she has to sort of, you know, I, I cook her ribeye steaks or whatever and chop them up and put them in a container and she kind of defiantly eats her ribeye steak while she gets glared at by, by the militant vegans in her school. But, um, you know, she's a tough, tough girl. So, you know, she knows how much better it makes her feel. And uh, so she has no intention of being pressured into not eating the way that it makes her feel healthy. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's two things because i mean did, did she notice uh was she also like you having multiple dislocations did, did that improve or yeah. she, uh, um yes you know it's interesting in families where there are multiple uh in families with multiple members uh, having eds of course you all have the same type right because it's inherited um but you might have different expressions so some may be more severe and some may be um, a little less uh, problematic. Um, Anya, my daughter's name is Anya, she really started having joint dislocations quite young, younger than I remember having them. And, and you know, she in some ways is far more hypermobile than I am in certain areas of her body. She can fold her spine in half and, you know, put her rear end on the back of her head, you know, that kind of the Cirque du Soleil level of... Uh, <laughs> Uh, joint hypermobility. Uh, I don't let her do that. Um, but um, she uh, is not having as, as much pain. She was having, you know, uh, um, a lot of pain in the ankles, knees, and hips, that whole syndrome, paterofemoral syndrome. And she that has considerably improved. Um, and she's not having the, the same repetitive dislocations. I'm, and I've talked to several other people, not in my family, but people with EDS, um, Women's Carnivore Tribe on Facebook. There are, it's got something like women all on the carnivore diet. And there are a number of us with Anders Danlos syndrome who are having similar results. Hey folks, Human Performance Outliers podcast is growing. And due to the growth, we are looking to take on some new sponsors. So if you feel like your company or organization would be a good fit for our audience, please do not hesitate to reach out to hpopodcast at gmail.com. Thank you. Yeah, that, I mean, that, again, that's just such a fascinating thing. I, I, I just yeah. can't imagine how potentially impactful this will be, you know, particularly if, it's, if we, we get people to, to get on board with this stuff. But the other thing that really, I mean, you, you said your daughter goes to a vegan school, well, did, did the high school. Not, it, high yeah. school. I mean, do they not? Do they just have no meat in the cafeteria at all? Is that where they're at? One day a week, they have some meat dish, and but it's always sort of a, 
accompanied by a lot of sort of shaming and you know and, and it's you know this isn't even really well thought out vegan food you know i mean there are vegans and vegans you know and a lot of teenage vegans sort of eat like teenagers do right they just sort of eat whatever but um th this is not great food she sometimes sends me pictures of it just for my entertainment sake and it pretty much looks like salt but, uh, <laughs> uh, it just it's not Typical for schools here, that's not reflective of Danish schools. This just happens to be this school. They made that decision years ago, and they, it's always been a vegan cafeteria. Yeah, and I think like that's that's got to be difficult for your daughter. I mean, that I used to teach high school, and like I'm very aware of kind of the social navigation of that age group, and you know, you're easily pressured into doing things that you maybe wouldn't otherwise do, or you know, hide something you're doing that uh, you just don't want to take the backlash from. But when it comes right. to something like, like your daughter's situation where she's kind of like, well, if I cave to the social pressures, I have to deal with this reality of you know, joint dislocation. And uh, certainly she watched you kind of go through any of the troubles right. you had with that, plus the, the, the lack of troubles, I guess, now so as things have gotten a little better. Right. And kind of knows like, well, I know what I have to do, but uh, that's still got to be difficult for her, I would think. Yeah, it was a process, you know, when she, because she started at this school, this last school, beginning this school, last school year in the fall. And um, so she was the new kid, you mm -hmm. know, and so at first she sort of just ate what they were eating. Um, and then she realized she didn't want to do that. So she would kind of go outside and eat the food that she wanted to eat. And now she's at the point where she doesn't even care. <laughs> she just sits down in the cafeteria and eats what, you know, whatever she brought for school that day. And, but, you know, I, I went to a, a, a school event with her recently and I took a good, you know, both the, the mom in me and the doctor in me took a good long look at those kids. And a lot of them, you know, Danish kids are in far better shape in general than American kids. You know, we don't yet have the obesity quite to the degree that, you know, that we have in the United States, but they're on their way. The, 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 there's increasing type two diabetes here, metabolic syndrome and obesity. And, and so I looked at these kids, so these kids who I knew, the ones who I knew were actually vegans, not just eating at the vegan uh, cafeteria at lunchtime, but who were vegans. And they look, they're not in great shape. They look not healthy. It's not, other than being sort of pudgy looking, you know, dark circles under their eyes. They just, you know, they don't, they don't look well. So, and my daughter looks very different than we do. Has she had any stories with classmates who kind of have seen that and was like, well, this, this gal looks yes. like she's thriving and these gals don't. <laughs> Maybe I'll try what yeah. she's doing. <laughs> yeah. Um, she has one or two who are less militant, who have been one, a guy and a girl, who have both been asking her questions. And um, little by little, you know, so I have since sent some of them some information. Um, you know, something by Dr. Paul Mason and um, some of them are struggling with, with, uh, with you know, insomnia and anxiety and stress. And so I sent doc, Dr. Georgia Eads, I, I send a lot of people Dr. Georgia Eads talk on descent into madness, the uh, connection between nutrition and mental health. And, um, <clears throat> and little by little, I talk to them, a few of the ones who are open to it, and she is talking to them about uh, um, at least reducing your carbohydrates, you know, just starting there. Let's get the sugar out of your diet and cut the carbohydrates. Down. But so she has one or two in her class, but there are some who are completely not there. You know, they're the more more likely to throw red paint on you and kind of, you know, you know, <laughs> you know so it, it, it's variable. I, just I, have, just... I have, oh, go ahead, sorry. No, I was going to say, I'm just curious about it. I'm curious about the general climate in Denmark because I know I see like places like Finland where you know the army has mandated two vegetarian meals a week you know we're seeing you know we're seeing you know, like northern Belgium where they're talking about you know going plant-based and we've got this whole sort of 
you know, obviously it's, we're going to save the environment by, by not eating meat, but what is the general climate like in Denmark? I mean, you point out this vegan school, which to me is just bizarre, but at the same time, uh, it I, it's not as surprising. So how, how are we doing in Denmark um, overall? Well, I definitely see more of a push towards mm -hmm. plant-based diets. So you remember the whole eat, you know, eat consortium and the lots of a lot of that was Scandinavian based, right? The the main co-sponsors were Norwegian and you know a lot a lot of it was out of Scandin uh, out of Sweden. And so um, I see, you know, you see more and more plant-based alternative lunch meats and you know uh, soy you know, uh, you know, whatever glop in, in <laughs> sold next to the ground beef, made to look like ground beef for some reason. And um, you, you do see more of it. I, I noticed um, in Copenhagen, there were big signs that appeared in English, which is unusual, saying, you know, basically saying, you know, do you have a problem um, with eating meat, we can help you. As if it's like an adverse an advertisement for for a, you know alcohol or drugs or something, quitting alcohol or drugs. Um, it was very strange and very strange that it was in English. It was unusual and an, an enormous science, huge, you know, a few meters high. Um, and um, so there is definitely a push there. I would say the regular Danish population, not so much. You know, <laughs> the Danes eat a lot of pork. They eat a lot of, you know, baby back ribs are one of their biggest exports. Danish pork is a huge Danish, um, you know, agricultural product, um, <clears throat> as is for the Swedes as well. So I would say regular average Danes, not so much, but there is definitely an increasing push towards plant-based diets that I can see that's visible. I'm just kind of, you know, because you're an ER physician, and I know, like, you know, as a physician, you know, I'm just imagining, um, you know, like, I, I can tell you, like, I, there was, when I was doing it, there, I was operating on this 99-year-old woman with a broken femur, and, you know, in the middle of the surgery, her heart stopped, and so I had to go out there and, you know, do CPR, and I'm in there pounding on her chest, and at 99, I was like, there's no way this woman's going to live or survive a code at 99, but mm -hmm. she did. I mean, you know, she actually they did. Be tough, right? <laughs> the, the next day she was pissed off at me because her chest hurt. I probably cracked her. her she pumped her. <laughs> but she lived, lived six months later and she was still alive, but I, I just thought it was amazing. But I'm just imagining, I know in the ER, I mean, that's a regular part of the day. And I can't imagine going in there and thinking, hey, my shoulder's going to dislocate in the middle of doing CPR. And I don't know if you have somebody, how does that work with you at work with, with, you know, you're, you're in there seeing patients doing procedures potentially, and then, you know, maybe your darn elbow dislocates, your wrist dislocates, your shoulder dislocates in the middle of it. How, how did you navigate that? Yeah, luckily, I so here in Denmark, I haven't been doing as much emergency medicine because, frankly, emergency medicine isn't a specialty. Um, I run a clinic for homeless youth, and that's a whole other thing that I do. But when I was in the States, when I, when I do go to the States and practice, when I'm in the States practicing, yes, it can, like, for example, just um, intubating a patient, pulling up on the laryngoscope, my wrist would sometimes go. Again, I did the same things that I do in the gym. I wrapped my joints, I, you know, but a lot of us, I have, uh, uh, I know a couple of other um, emergency doctors with ehlers danlos Syndrome who have ended up doing things like telemedicine and, or, you know, working less, you know, um, intense in working in departments that aren't so busy or um, don't get as much trauma, for example, because sometimes it's, you know, the trauma codes that are pretty full contact sport and, um, you know, but um, it, it's, it can be really challenging, really difficult. You know, you, I mean, I sucked it up basically <laughs> and dealt with it, but it's hard. You know. It's difficult. Yeah, I mean, I can't, you know, because I mean, what I was, you know, as an orthopedic guy, I mean, I'm, I'm swinging a big hammer, you know, right. knocking in hips, you know, putting, you right. know, putting replacements in there. Yeah, and I, pretty I reduced, hip. I reduced dislocated hip. I mean, I use, I, yeah. I, I, I propofol is my friend, <laughs> so I don't have to pull so hard, you know. I sedate people. I do use conscious sedation to sedate people or to, you know, reduce shoulders and big, large, larger joint dislocations or, you know. You know, fractures that I need to 
the line hardness, things like that. But yeah. And have you seen any, I mean, any colleagues, I mean, I don't know if you're working, you know, what you're doing there in Denmark, if you're around other positions and, and have they commented or noted or have you told them what's going on and what's been the reception if you have? Yeah. Everybody stops me and says, what are you doing? <laughs> People, whether it's, you know, uh, you know uh, other doctors or it's just uh, the mothers of my children's friends, uh, neighbors, you know, people say, wow, you've lost a lot of weight and you look really great. What are you doing? Um, and so since the time that I've started doing this, I've now started sort of, you know, I've had many people write to me effectively saying, help, you know, what can I do? And um, I'm having great success with the people that I've, I've put on this diet. Um, if I can get them on the corn diet, I do. If they're not ready for that, I try to put them on a ketogenic diet in hopes of getting them over to the carnivore diet later, if that's, you know, what seems right for them. Um, I uh, have a friend that I kind of help her put her foot on this path, and she's, I think she must have. I think she's probably lost close to 100 pounds. Her diabetes numbers have completely normal, normalized out. Her A1C is normal. Um, all of her labs are completely normal. And she's been, you know, struggled with obesity as chronic post-gastric um, bypass, you know, patient and has nothing has ever worked. And this is the first thing that's ever worked for her, you know. And she has her own version of doing it. She does mostly fish and eggs and things like that, but because she still, she used to be sort of weird about eating meat and she still hasn't quite gotten there yet, but she's getting there. But she still managed to succeed. You know, I think that um, it's just a matter of time and hopefully, you know, maybe you'll be willing to participate, but I think there's uh, a need to, to get some research out there on this stuff because it's so Absolutely. powerful. Uh, in my, you know, and again, I'm obviously biased, but in my view, it's probably the most powerful dietary intervention you can do for, for a lot of things, in, in, including chronic disease and, and, and I guess even Absolutely. genetic disease in some case. Um, are any any thoughts about getting like maybe getting a case report into the literature? I mean, that's something you'd be you'd be interested in doing. I mean, I think that would. I mean, I've talked Absolutely. to I've talked I mean, to people. I, I would be. Yeah, I've talked to people from like the National Cattle Beef Association about getting some funding for actual research for intervention trials for stuff, but I do think that. Getting some case reports in the literature at first will will go a long way. And there's there's a few out of you know, Paleo Medicine Group has got some in there. So I don't know if you're, you know, if you've got somebody. I mean, I don't know if you can do a case report on yourself or have somebody write you up or something like that. That, that is so, probably better to have someone else write me up. Right. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I don't know uh, because I, I don't think I don't think it would have much validity if I wrote it. You know, yeah, no, then it becomes a testimonial. But, but yeah. it's, at the same time, I mean, this is truly. I mean, I, like I said, I've yeah. seen some incredible, incredible stories, but I mean, to me, this is right up there with one of the, one of the most impressive. Yeah. And just because it's a genetic disease, which really, you know, kind of boggles my yeah. mind a little bit. It and, uh, amazes me. I had no expectations on that part. I really didn't have any expectations. Um, I just wanted to feel a little better. And my thinking was, if I, if I, I, I know, even though I wasn't that overweight, it was overweight enough to be a problem for me and um, to worsen my joint hypermobility with dislocations, et cetera. And just the overall pain, it worsened my joint pain to be carrying around you know, that much weight. So I thought, okay, I know if I lower my carbohydrates, I'll lose weight, because I always do. You know? And that made complete and logical sense to me, of course. But I didn't have any other expectations. I had none. I had no idea it would change my joint stability. I had no idea that my POTS symptoms would, they're pretty minimal. I've had one or two episodes of POTS and that's usually um, when I get a little hypovolemic because maybe I've been fasting or I have been doing, I do intermittent fasting just because it happened to not because I really tried to, but I didn't need to eat sometimes for 16 or 18 hours after you've had a couple of your buy steaks, you know, that was plenty. And I, I didn't even realize I was doing intermittent fasting until I sort of backed up and read about it. Like, oh, okay. um, but so my pot symptoms have improved. I had no expectations about um, autoimmune symptoms at all. I, I could not connect the two in my mind in any way. I had no great explanation other than inflammation, perhaps, who knows. Um, but um, it's 
I also just the brain clarity, losing that brain fog that, you know, that I was getting. I, was, I don't know if it was associated with um, chronic pain or fatigue or um, autoimmune problems, but that's gone. My mental clarity is so much better than it has been in a really long time. Just feeling sharper, more energetic, more focused. Um, so the, 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 I expected to lose a little weight and maybe feel a little better. That was sort of, if I expected anything, I knew I would lose weight because frankly, you lose weight when you cut carbohydrates, period. You're going to lose weight. And that, that is about all I expected. I expected none of the rest of this. And I yeah, am so continually, and continually surprised. So, I mean, it sounds like, you know, you'd lost weight before and you didn't, you didn't see the benefits with regard to the joint subluxations and dislocations. No, that, that, that's a great point. Thanks for pointing that out. So when I, when I was in med school and I felt like we'd all sort of put on weight and off, I gathered up a bunch of, you know, women in my class and I started this little group called squatting for board scores, you know, because we were about to take our boards part two and we had a little game we played, you know, and I got us all in the gym and working out and that's when I first cut down carbohydrates and I lost, I lost weight. I got in great shape, but I still had joint dislocation. And during that time, I had probably one of my first huge bilateral shoulder dislocations doing shoulder shore. I was in the gym. Both of my shoulders just dropped straight out of place. And I kind of walked over to the emergency department on campus with both shoulders out. And, uh, you know, it, it, it didn't affect my joint stability at all. Even though I was fit, I was strong, I was in good shape, there was something else going on here because I'm – there's no great logical reason for me to have improved joint stability now. I mean, I figured that the joints that were trashed were trashed. I assumed my shoulders were trashed. I was talking about what we could do to at least try to stabilize them. I canceled that point because <laughs> I don't need it anymore. You know, I mean, just again, and it, uh, just not to belabor this point, but I mean, you know, you are obviously living a life of disability. I mean, anybody wakes up every day with, yes. you know, don't know Absolutely. what joint's going to be dislocated today and, and to go from that. And so there are people out there that would say that humans don't need meat. We don't need to eat it anymore. We should tax it. We should legislate it. We should restrict it. We should, you know, uh, you know, we should limit people's access to it. How does that make you feel? And are you concerned about that sort of, you know, sort of belief system that we need to do that. Absolutely. I mean, we did a thing here in Denmark a few year, a handful of years ago, they started a fat tax and they taxed foods with fat in them, full fat, dairy, meats, things like that. And all it did was make those foods, which are some of the most nutritious foods, more expensive for people and pushed people into buying more junk carbohydrates and other things. Um, they actually repealed the tax, but they never lowered the prices back. So that's another little tricky thing that happens. <laughs> but I, I think regulating people's nutrition, you know, uh, the government or whoever, regulating what people can and can't eat is that worries me. I find that concerning, especially considering that I know that most of the nutri nutritional information we teach in the medical community is flatly wrong. It's just wrong. And that the results that we're seeing with people on a carnivore diet, or other people who are on a ketogenic diet, um, it defies all conventional wisdom in terms of what you and I learned in medical school and how people should be eating. And clearly, um, we shouldn't be um, creating uh, legislation or, or food regulation based on faulty data. Yeah, you know, and it's nutrition is, the, I, I think, one of the goofiest of them all, just because it, when you really start to unpack a lot of this stuff, what you end up finding out is we don't know nearly as much as we think we know. So yeah. like, I, what, with, that's an understatement. <laughs> uh -huh, yeah. And with like any type of government legislation, it's also like you're trying to kind of consider a lot of the unforeseen consequences and, you know, hopefully enough people do their homework to the point when that sort of thing does happen that you've looked through it, that you kind of know what unforeseen consequences are potentially going to come up and you have a kind of a plan B for those. But when it comes to nutrition, it's a, we're nowhere near that from what I can tell. So like that's, it does get really scary when you start seeing that sort of thing take place. Like 
Yeah, and I, re- I actually even remember this. I can't remember how long ago it was now when New York was going to put the soda tax in. And mm-hmm. it, I mean, it sounded, it sounded great on paper. It's like, cool, yeah, we should probably stop people from drinking mega, mega gulps, big gulps. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. But then the unforeseen <laughs> consequence there is you open up that can of worms. Now all of a sudden it, the, the, it can the, be the yeah, the precedent was set that, okay, we can, we can influence people's dietary choices through monetary expression from the government. And it's like, gets mm-hmm. dicey at that point. So yeah, yeah I, I find that problematic as well. I would much rather we educated people <laughs> about mm-hmm. making better nutritional choices and didn't penalize them when, when they do make good nutritional choices. No, I'm going to just, and, and hopefully this isn't a topic you don't want to discuss, but there has been, and as I remember, I mean, kind of seeing your profile on Twitter over the, over the year, kind of, it's kind of changed a little bit, but there has been a sort of an association that people like the carnivore diet are all a bunch of conservative right wing you know, Nazi <laughs> yeah. type people. And, and my understanding is maybe that doesn't describe you very accurately. Is that is that no? Can we I'm, talk I'm about pretty much a left wing, uh, left lefty Democrat, uh, liberal feminist. So yeah, that's one of my favorite stereotypes. That everybody on the carnivore diet are all right wing, you know, extreme right wing, you know, gun toting, you know, whatever, you know, Republicans and and every and and. And Democrats are somehow we're all you know vegetarian. You know, I get called my favorite insult from the right wing is they call me what a a a, a pink veggie uh, a pink uh, snowflake. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and, and it's the vegan part that bugs me. Um, and <laughs> but uh, no, there are lots of us. I, I I'm followed by lots of people on Twitter, and I. Lots of people on Twitter who are more more democratic or more who are Democrats or more left who are more centrist, and it really bugs me that stereotype because it is the exact thing about the whole vegan thing that bothers me. When your whole identity and politics are wrapped up in what you eat, there's something a little wrong there. Uh, I, you know, it becomes kind of like a false religion in a way. Um, and I, I'm determined not to make that happen with the carnivore diet. You know, the carnivore diet is something I do that makes me feel well. It, it's curing me or making or improving chronic illnesses. I feel great. And it, it has nothing to do with my politics. You know, nothing. Yeah, I, I, I've made this point many times. I've said meat doesn't care who you vote for. It's, you know, no. <laughs> food doesn't care. No. I, I hate the way too, we, some people try to make it a political thing and, Absolutely. Like they're in there saying, well, all the vegans are lefto, communist, fascist, whatever. And, no, I, you know, I, mean, I know. I've met plenty of right-wing vegans, you know, right. who are you know, anti-abortion, anti, you know, it's all kind of lumped in together for them. And so it's really just a fallacy. It's just not true. Yeah, and, I, mean, I mean, certainly we need to get the politics out of food. I think that's great. And the absolutely. religion out of food. That's absolutely the it, truth. And I, well, I, I couldn't agree it, more. It, it means we can't, we can't, you know, the, I've mentioned the women's carnivore tribe and we're really good at just leaving other stuff outside of it. And we just talk about the carnivore diet and any questions that come up for the different women in the group and the issues and maybe stuff that's more germane to women and stuff women go through and um, food issues that women have and all of that. And, and whenever there has been a moment where somebody has sort of dragged something in, it can really derail the conversation. So we really just try to keep it out of there, you know, and <clears throat> whenever I see, see that come up, I, in any other discussions I have, I just try to remind people, let's leave, please. And I mean, I'm a hyper political person, but not when it comes to my diet. And I talk to all kinds of, you know, I don't care if they're, you know, right wing political pe- people or, you know, whoever, I don't care when, if we're talking about the carnivore diet or we're talking about health and nutrition, it's, I work with, you know, in, in medicine, a lot of the docs I work with are, you know, conservative Republicans. We still do the same job together. We have to be able to leave our politics out of it. Yeah. And what you highlight with that too, I think is just whenever I'm talking about politics with folks, it's, you know, usually most people want to know like, well, where do your politics lie? Like what group do you identify with? And I always cringe a little bit with that just because I'm like, uh, let's look at each policy 
individually. And I can tell you where I fall along each one of these policies, but I, and, and maybe that puts me under more under one umbrella than another, but uh, I would love it if we could get to a point where we don't necessarily look at things as like, this person is this party or you know, that ideology and this person on this specific policy, this is where they're leaning or this is where their beliefs are. And, uh, you know, folks like you, I think kind of promote that because it's hard to put your finger down on, on some stuff like that when, when you, when, when you kind of fit under different umbrellas in certain topics right. like that. Absolutely. I mean, in some ways I would be considered very left on some topics and in some ways talk to me about some other topic, national security or whatever, and I'm definitely pretty centrist, you know? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think it doesn't really help to shove ourselves in a box and say, I have to check all these boxes. I mean, I, I grew up a long time ago and, and stopped feeling like I needed to check boxes to be the perfect progressive or the perfect this or that, you know, it mm -hmm. doesn't work. But definitely when it comes to, to nutrition and, 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 and the carnivore diet, I absolutely feel the need. We just need to, to leave that out of it or we'll derail ourselves before we ever get any answers. You know. I think the, 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 the thought about the women's carnivore tribe, and I remember they, they told me they were gonna start that up and I said, awesome, it's, it's wonderful to see how it's grown so much. And yeah, I think it's well over 10,000 yeah. people now, if I'm not mistaken. It's almost 11,000 now, yeah. Yeah, and, and I'm bummed because I can't. Yes, group. I can't yeah, go in there because I'm a man, so it's kind of funny, <laughs> I can't get in there. Thing. But um, I was going to say, it is so important for women, you know, to, for this message to get out to women, because women make the decisions on nutrition in most households. I mean, it's just clear they, they're the one to decide what the kids eat. And it is so important to get this information out to women. And I think that's, uh, that's yeah. a wonderful thing. And, and I thank you for being part of that and sharing that. And hopefully we can, you know, like I said, it's an uphill battle for sure. I, you know, I, I continually say it's, it's, you know, it's just basically processed food companies trying to make a bunch of money and they're just trying to convince us to give up actual nutrition for their kind of pseudo nutrition. And that's what it's yeah. all about. Profit. And now they've targeted the vegans, you know, so yeah, that's, I always find that very interesting that the, the vegans don't really understand that they're just being targeted by these processes and by Nestle and by big food companies making new junk food products that they can slap a vegan label on and you know mm -hmm. they're delighted about it but <laughs> well in a lot of in a lot of the associational epidemiological studies that are in support of plant-based vegan diet their their biggest uh advantage i think historically has been it has been better than the standard american diet like it sure. may be not if be you're a, eating a whole food vegan diet right exactly so i think yeah, as we see more yeah, you see more junk food companies enter that world and essentially push their products on the vegan community. You could see a scenario in which now all of a sudden the vegan diet in from a percentage standpoint becomes more on par with the standard American diet. And then they would agree. That leverage altogether. Uh, and I mean, that's not a, <laughs> that's not a, a slight or something I'd be hoping for, I guess I should say, but it, it's, it's definitely a potential. I think we see that everywhere too. I mean, we see it a little bit in the keto movement too, where people yes. start using tools as uh, staples, I guess is the way to say it. Uh, right. And uh, not Maybe necessarily look at keto it. Desserts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Living on keto desserts. Yeah. I, mm -hmm. I watched that happen. They fall into their same eating patterns. They're just sort of keto and, mm -hmm. you know, and we're very fond of that in, in America and in Western countries in general, we sort of have these health food trends and then the food companies pick up on it and they can slap a gluten-free label on it or a vegan label or a keto mm -hmm. label, you know, and, and it's, it's a little bit silly because you get away from the whole point of what you're trying to do. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting because I know like a lot of times the keto community is at odds with the kind of calories in calories out community. Uh, and it's, or at least that's how it ends up showing up on Twitter, which is maybe not the best spot to watch all that play out. <laughs> Probably it, anything. On Twitter, yeah. Right? Sometimes when I see that, I'm just like thinking like, you know, you guys could really kind of fix a couple issues here if you would just work to, I don't know if I'd say work together, but kind of maybe right. keep an open mind about that because you know, you have the, the, if you take the keto diet and put it in the context of you being mindful of energy intake, instead of just kind of mm -hmm. saying, oh, this has no carbs in it, so I can eat as much of it as I want, uh, you know, you could probably fix some of the 
some of the hurdles that even the, the keto community has when it comes to weight management and stuff like that. So it is interesting, but, um, I agree. <laughs> I agree. awesome. Um, let's see, do we have anything else we want to chat about Sean Don or? You know, I, I don't, you know, I, I don't know unless Donnie, you have something else you want to, you want to discuss. Um, this has been so incredibly awesome. I think this is one of the most, interesting and potentially powerful testimonials that I've seen, you know, with the power of this particular, you know, nutritional strategy. I think it's just awesome. And I'm interested to hear more and learn more and see if, if this applies to more and more people. I think it will. Um, you know, like I said, I encourage you to keep, keep spreading the word like everybody. You know, I think that more of us yeah. get up there and, and, and just use whatever platform we have, we can, you know, we can, we can counter this uh, because I think there's a, a lot of work that needs to be done. And uh, yeah. I've got Maximus here trying to trying to I'm, talk to me. <laughs> he wants to be the fourth I, guest. <laughs> he's, 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 my English bull terrier has not jumped on my lap. So. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, where can folks find you, uh, Dawn? And uh, you know, let us know what else you got coming up. Just just for people that might be interested. Yeah, you mean on social media? Or anything you want to talk about? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, where can they find me? Yeah, like social media, website, that yeah, sort of stuff. I'm, I'm either, I'm Dawn Layton on, um, on Facebook, or else you can find me on Twitter. I'm um, Jane Doe, or it's at Sarage, a, a, at C-A-E-R-A-G-E. They put my Twitter handle is Jane Doe. And uh, you can find me there. Awesome. Cool. And we'll, we'll link to those resources in the show notes so folks can click over to them if they want to check out kind of what you're up to and uh, check in on, on progress or whatever else you want to share. Yeah, I do. I do uh, post. Pro it's a little easier on Facebook to do more detailed progress, obviously, because the format allows mm -hmm. you to be longer. And, um, but I do periodically post and I, it's getting close to a year and I'm going to do a big year, you know, here I was a year ago and here I am today. So I'll be doing that soon. Yeah, maybe you ought to do a, like a little YouTube video. That would be really cool. I think that could be- Yeah, that's a good idea. Very- I've never done one, but- <laughs> I mean, it's, I, I think the video format works well. And, and again, thank you so much for coming on. Yeah. Zach, I guess we're good for now. Awesome. Okay. Yeah, thank you so much for coming on, Don. Hey, it was great. Thanks so much for asking me. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast with hosts Dr. Sean Baker and Zach Bitter. If you enjoyed the show, please consider following us on social media and checking out our websites. Links to those can be found in the show notes. Also, if you have any questions or comments, please do not hesitate to shoot us an email at hpopodcast at gmail.com. Thanks again for tuning into the show.